so the first comment, as I said before, is that uh, this is really an interface science, right? Uh, please remind me that I give you this reference on the, on the history of control. Uh, in the end, in a way or another, it's always about, you know, l trying to understand how to manipulate, modify or modify or control, steer, design a given state Y in terms of a control V. But of course, one of the key issues that uh, control scientists have to solve is how to model this. Some people say, no, no, I always write in, in the static setting. Well, if you try to avoid time, there are a number of things you can do, because there are indeed many things that are in a steady state regime, right? Uh, but uh, sometimes if you have to deal time with time, then people will say, well, I do it quasi-static. This is a way people try to understand dynamics, right? So you try to understand equations which are time independent, and then you jump little by little, right? So these are the quasi-static approaches. Some people will tell you it's useless to try to do it deterministic. Everything is random in the world. Well, yes, but uh, let me try to do deterministic, and then if not, doesn't fit quite, let me try to then deal with the randomness uh, by some kind of parameter depending on scenario. But please allow me not to put the randomness from the very beginning. Uh, some people will tell you there is nothing linear in the world. Everything is non-linear. You know, waves breaking in the sea are non-linear. Otherwise, they wouldn't break. Linear waves propagate forever without uh, undergoing uh, singularities. Okay, so in principle, models should be time-dependent, PDEs, stochastic, random, parameter-dependent, non-linear, but this is like too much. So you can then reduce right, the model as much as you wish, uh, the limit being the precision you are required to uh, fulfill uh, in your business, right? Uh, and please keep in mind that it is much easier to say that the shortest distance between A and B is the straight line and say this is obvious than trying to develop a calculus of variation proof using uh, uh, integrals and derivatives that uh, could lead you uh, very far. Okay, so then the modeling issue is very important. This is why control is very broad. Some people will prefer uh, Frequency domain approach, they will tell you, no, I don't even write the ODE or the PD. You know, in our lab, you know, we do experiments. So we take bars, we excite the bars with, uh, uh, you know, a number of uh, inputs that we have on tables. We know what the frequencies are. We measure the responses. And for us, the model is the Excel table. Right? This, this is, is done in practice, right? And then you say, yes, but you should discuss whether it's a beam, whether the beam is Timoshenko beam or is a Raleigh beam. But then you have to give me the Young coefficients. And people tell you, well, listen, in this lab, what we have is bars with experiments and a you know, Excel table with 20 data, 10 inputs and 10 outputs. OK? So models are sometimes uh, like this, right? Could be just an Excel table, and this happens very often. You talk to, you know, companies, uh, uh, electrical companies here in Basque Country, for instance. I remember they have a huge uh, electrical networks in Chile. You know, uh, crossing Chile, how many kilometers? Six thousand, six thousand kilometers, right? Uh, uh, do you really want to write down a? a telegraph equation or an ODE for this 6,000 uh, kilometer long uh, network? No, they just have data, right? They are measuring data and they are trying to make sure that the network is working well and there are not uh, no singularities and uh, catastrophes occurring and that, uh, you know, the, 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 the current is evolving in a more or less uh, fluent and uniform manner, right? Okay, modeling, then linear versus nonlinear, deterministic, stochastic, finite dimensional versus uh, infinite dimensional, ODE versus PDE. Okay. Then it can be an optimal control uh, point of view. It can be a controllability point of view in which you really 
take the point of view of dynamical systems and you say, well, I want to reach to that target exactly, but as I said, even if you do this, when you formulate that from a computational point of view, often you come back to this, because very much the problem becomes, rather than getting exactly trying to minimize the distance to the target, <coughs> and then, and this is something I have mentioned before, and this is important, there is the output, uh, th sorry, the, the feedback versus open loop versus closed loop control, right? Open loop control is, you know, that uh, you take all the time at home to decide how and when are you going, you know, on trip. But of course, you will never be able to anticipate that once you are driving, Maybe a dog is crossing the highway and yeah, you have to take a real-time decision, right? So open loop control in which, you know, the control is designed a priori uh, is very nice from a mathematical point of view, but in practical applications is, that, is not that useful because, again, for, for the same reasons as we mentioned before, you can never completely anticipate what the model is, right? Because there can be unexpected events that occur and that modify actually the dynamics of the system, right? See. Si. Can you in this case uh, add randomness to, so you, you consider the deterministic point of view, you prove everything in the deterministic point of view, but with the randomness. So instead of working with feedback, you still work in open loop, but with random, right? Okay, so the idea is that once you have a feedback, you have a range of stability. So stability is an open concept, right? That's nice. Oh, by the way, I didn't say this. Uh, exercise, uh, which is the number? Eight. Eight. Exercise number eight, proof that the karma, that the controllability is an open condition. Well, this is almost uh, trivial, right? But So what does it mean open, to be open? It means that uh, it's fulfilled by neighbors. So it means that if A and B fulfill Kalman, a matrix which is near A will also fulfill Kalman with the same B, and that also if you modify B a little bit, this is a stable. So that's very good news, right? Is that once a system is controllable, this is a robust, so this is the property that is very much requested in control systems, robustness, right? You, you certainly heard of this. So. Stability, robustness, the persistency of the properties under perturbations. And in that sense, well, this is also related to what you are saying. Uh, stability, stability of a finite uh, dimensional linear dynamical system is also an open, quest or an open property, right? Because we say that uh, a linear system of ODEs has a spectrum. Is it stable when? when the spectrum is to the left. Right? And this is an open property. I mean, in order to push the eigenvalues from the left, you have here, you see, there is a clear spectral abscissa here, right? There is a clear spectral abscissa. To push this spectral abscissa to the right, you have to modify an eigenvalue by an amount, and this needs to modify the model by that amount, right? So this means that if you have a system which is uh, stable, right, if you put some perturbations in time, you will preserve this stability, provided this uh, perturbation is moderate, right? Uh, and then, then what was this business of the Tacoma Bridge? You remember? You know the Tacoma Bridge, right? Exercise nine. Watch the video of the Tacoma Bridge. Yeah, it's, but it's not in Netflix, right? So it's in uh, YouTube, right? Nothing to do with Netflix. Okay. Yeah, like. 
Uh, just uh, I don't know what the reason is. A proper vibration of the uh, right. of the bridge, and then uh, the makes this. Uh, yeah. So precisely, that's very interesting, right? But the point is that in some sense, in those cases, we are dealing with flexible structures in which the spectrum is on the imaginary axis, right? And then if you excite this frequency, this can produce a resonance, right? Yeah, it's a resonance. But, but uh, keep in mind, keep in mind this. So the Tacoma Bridge is about this model, right? It's about you take this harmonic oscillator and then you excite by a periodic forcing. So then intuition fails, well, not completely. Actually, you could anticipate this, right? But uh, maybe the first time you think on this, you don't realize the risk of resonance. So what is this system doing? Uh, this system is a system of oscillations. Up and down, up and down, up and down. This is a spring, right? Up and down, up and down, periodic. Up and down, up and down. And now, uh, the other guy, the sinusoidal, is pushing, right? Is pushing also in a periodic manner, right? So the, the force, you know, is 1 and minus 1, is 1 and minus 1, and this is periodic as well, right? What uh, the uh, resonance phenomena tells you, and this is what happens, and happened in particular to this uh, Tacoma Bridge business, was that if you are unlucky enough that both of them cooperate, so lambda is equal to 1, so that the periodicity is the same, then, you know, 1 is, you know, uh, oscillating like this, and the other one is pushing exactly with the same frequency, you know, this can, you know, go to infinity. While if lambda is irrational with respect to the frequency here, this will not occur. Right? But, but this is a particular case where you are exciting a system which is in the limit of stability, right? Because this is a system in which the eigenvalues are 1, sorry, i and minus i. They are on the, ver on the imaginary axis, and then this is risky. If you have had some stability, for instance, guaranteed by some velocity feedback, Right? If you have some damping dam, uh, built in the system so that the system is exponentially stable, then you know, the response of this system will not be any more uh, resonant. Okay? Very good. Someone has said that, uh, someone did a number theory. You, uh, who said? Uh, you. You did. So, all this is also related with ergodic theory, right? You, you know about ergodic theory? Do you know about ergodic theory? No? 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 Okay, exercise number... Read, read uh, five lines about ergodic theory in the Wikipedia. It's not that hard, right? Well, you know, if actually. So this is uh, related to these uh, theories that uh, you know they bought uh, these. Uh, they were hyperactive, and then they was at, uh, they wanted to visit everything, right? I don't remember in which country it was. And they wanted to visit everything. So the travel agent organized an agenda where they will not rest, uh, you know, at most one hour on a, you know, for a short nap, right? They were, they were walking all the time, walking all the time, walking all the time, visiting different places, right? And then after one month of travel, they came back uh, complaining to the travel agent because they said, well, listen, we were walking 30 days all the time, you know, 24 destina destinations per day. And we only visited a few places, and they were, again, the same and the same again. So, you know, we want to complain. I mean, that guide was very bad, because we end up seeing something that we could have seen in the first three days. So you know what happened to them? Is that they were walking. They were walking. 
they were walking and then repeating again and again. You know why? Because the travel agent didn't pay attention to the fact that the program, right, the, the step in every, say, move in their visit should have been, you know, irrational with respect to pi. Because it's, if L is rational with respect to pi, if the length of your step is rational with respect to pi, after a finite number of steps you are back to the first hotel and then you will never quit the first uh, places you have visited. Right? So in particular if L can be written as pi p over q, right, where this is a, a reduced uh, fraction, after q steps you are back to the same motel and then you will never see anything more than that, okay? While if L is irrational with respect to pi, what happens? Huh? Then you will visit the whole circle. I mean, and these people will be so happy, right? They will have photos of everything, you know? This produces a dense sequence on the circle, right? Okay? This is a dense sequence on the circle. Right? This is about ergodicity, and you have to be very careful about this. Uh, you have to be very careful about this because this has a lot to do with also uh, sensor and uh, signals. And this is something, as I said, is the first thing you have to learn, right? So, for instance, uh, remember that the first thing you have to do, according to Norbert Wiener, is to measure, right? You need communication. You need to uh, place a sensor and make a good interpretation of your signal, right? So, assume you are dealing with a, a signal periodic with period to given. Okay? Assume you 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 want to and then you you want to measure this kind of single uh, signals so you have a number of actuators you know they are very cheap or sorry the sensors so these are just a few patches you know very cheap you know you get uh, one for one euro, so okay, you buy 100 and you have to place them, right? And then uh, you place uh, them, uh, let me see what I wanted to say, yeah. You place very many of them, right? Um, and uh, then sensors, you, you place sensors at the points TJ uh, which are of the form J delta T. That makes very much sense, right? Okay, so I have an interval. You give me 100, you know, if you give me 100 of them, because you had 100, you bought 100, very cheap, right? I place this 100 equidistributed in the interval, right? Um, the step size, uh, the distance being delta T, one over, you know, whatever the length of the interval is, divided by 100, right? Okay, that's clear, right? So I will place a patch here, another there, and another there, another there, another there, another there, right? With a distance delta t. Okay, so this is like when you go to take an electro, then they put you some patches and then they measure, okay? Good, um, fine. So I have periodic functions, and I have uh, sensors that I locate in an equidistributed manner according to this rule, right? Uh, and now you see it's the same problem as in uh, in the ergodicity. So assume uh, that tau goes to zero. 
So this signal is oscillating more and more, so the periodicity, right, is shorter and shorter, right? The periodicity is shorter and shorter. And then you say, okay, then I need more sensors, right? Because I need a better resolution, you give me more sensors. So you give me 10, 10 times more, you give me 1,000 now. And I continue with the same idea of putting this uh, equidistribution. So again, uh, the quantity not to ignore is whether this is rational or not. Right? This is what I wanted to say. Right? You have a function which is periodic. It oscillates more and more and more. Okay, then you say, very natural. If you oscillate more and more and more, I need a better resolution, so give me more and more and more sensors so that I place. I place them, you know, always in an equidistributed manner because otherwise I have to produce some kind of randomness and this is more complicated. I am a very well organized person, so I put them uh, uniformly. If you miss the fact that you have to make sure that this is right, irrational, it could well be that despite of the, uh, say, increasing uh, frequency of the oscillation, whenever you are looking to a unique cell, you only visit the same number of points, right? So the example is the following. Take a function, f, which is periodic of period 1. So f t plus 1 equal f of t. Now I produce the following function. Okay? This happens very often in composite materials. Material science also, composite materials so important. We know now, uh, you know, cars, uh, you pay more and uh, they are basically plastic, right? So they are now more expensive when there is more plastic on it. Incredible, right? Yes. But the point is that the material, there is plenty of plastic. But the material is a new material which is quite expensive and needs plenty of science on it, right? So this is the kind of things appearing in, uh, in material sciences, right? So you have a, uh, something which is uh, periodic. For instance, the mixture of two materials, A and B. Right? You mix two materials, metal and plastic. And then you say, well, but I like to, to mix more and more and more to make this material to be homogeneous and really uh, claim that this is, you know, uh, a, a, a composite material. So we have to distinguish a collage and a composite material. It's not the same, right? You bring this, you will say, well, this is a very nice painting, but please don't tell me that this is a composite material. You should mix a bit better to say that this is a composite material. Maybe it's art, but as a composite material, it's not a good thing. Okay? So then you have to uh, increase the frequency oscillation more and more and more, right? Okay, on the other hand, you say, well, but because I am dealing with signals or materials or properties that are oscillating more and more and more, I place more and more and more and more patches on the real line to better follow up, you know, the oscillations, the, the changes of the mixture. Okay, now I do that with a rate delta t. Assume that now I tell you, well, epsilon goes to zero, of course. Then delta t goes to zero, of course. But assume delta t is, say, like uh, uh, epsilon over three. You see what happens? Is that draw this function. In order to draw this function f, I don't need to draw it at the scale epsilon. It is for me sufficient to draw this function f at the scale 1. Because after that, it's periodic, right? It's periodic. So if you squeeze this by epsilon, right, the only thing I get is the same pattern squeezed. So now I am sampling this function more and more. But if I don't pay attention to the fact that delta t over epsilon is irrational, for instance, like this 1 over 3, you see that even if you put more and more and more patches, you are only visiting three points in the unit cell. And this is, sorry, yeah, maybe 
should put them here, right? These three points in the unit cell. And then you say, yes, but no, no, listen, it's impossible. I mean, how three points? I have hundreds, thousands, millions of sensors that I am putting there. Yes, but you were not careful. You were putting them, you know, in a very equidistributed manner. And then the signal was capricious enough to oscillate more and more, but always respecting this 1 over 3 ratio property. So you see, you are spending a fortune on censoring this function, and the only thing you are getting is the same amount of information that the first three sensors gave to you. Okay? So now you can, I mean, you can do it in reality, now you can make sure that you, the distance is irrational. Well, this is a good point. Yeah, this is for, you know, uh, Gaston, who is an expert in number theory. So uh, he will uh, tell us, maybe tomorrow, uh, Gaston, you can prepare this, you know, how to locate sensors on irrational points, right? No, that's a, that's a very good point, yeah. <laughs> and this is why this, the, the theory doesn't really go that way, right? It's more about compressed sensing, right? You are right. So I think, uh, I, I don't think the mathematically this is very, f I mean, because then you enter in this Diophantine approximation theory. You remember? Did you see Diophantine approximation theory? Okay, so read fab lines in Wikipedia on... <laughs> The Ophantine approximation. So this, I mean, these are paragraphs you can, uh, you, you, you know, as a, as a student on, you know, on bachelor or high school, you could, you could understand that. It's simply that there are irrational numbers. Irrational numbers are approximated by rationals, but the numerator and denominator have to go to infinity. And now you can distinguish the classes of irrational numbers depending how fast the denominator is going to infinity. And for instance, there are the Liouville numbers, which are uh, very complicated irrational numbers in which the denominator goes, uh, you know, uh, exponentially or as fast as you wish. So this is very nice from a mathematical point of view, but I agree with you that it will be probably, I don't know whether there is any application where people really play, uh, pay attention to whether they are locating the sensor in an irrational or irrational point. What actually a lot is being done, please note the four, uh, next exercise, read five, la five lines about uh, compressed sensing. Did you ever heard about compressed sensing? See? Si? No? No? Of which physical domain? I mean, so compressed sensing, there is, uh, I mean, uh, people, again, many people contributed to the well, One of them is Terence Tao, who also got the FIS medal in 2006, and Donohoe in Stanford. And the idea is that essentially uh, you can get uh, 100 minus epsilon percent of the information out of epsilon percent samples huh? so this is the like a miracle right get so if this was a bank i mean everyone would like to invest in this bank right so is, you give me epsilon, well, rather we do it the reverse. I give you epsilon and you give me 100 minus epsilon. That's not convenient for me. Okay. If epsilon is more. So the point is that uh, here, here, I am thinking very rationally, Cartesian, right? So I do, uh, you know, grids which are uniform. Because I believe it's better, right? I do it uniform because I believe it's better. But in fact, in that case, even if I use many, 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 many sensors, the quality of what I, the quality of what, what I can guarantee is not sufficient in case 
there is some kind of resonant behavior. You see here this idea of resonances, right? So the periodicity pattern of the signal fits completely with the periodicity or the uniformity pattern of the sampling, and then in the end you get a very low quality information. So I, I should have rather put these uh, sensors randomly, and it will have been better, right? Actually, you know, there, is, uh, uh, there are these uh, games to, to distinguish between humans and machines, right? Uh, I, I don't know exactly how, but the idea is the following. So, uh, well, I'm, I'm lecturing, uh, and uh, you don't know whether you are lecturing to humans or machines, right? The Turing test, yeah. yeah, the Turing test is good. Cool. Well, no, no, I mean, what I'm taking is something much simpler. Ah. I mean, that we used to do here, I mean, in the statistics, right? So then you say, uh, no, no, what you are saying is much more interesting. But what I am saying is, uh, is quite sufficient, actually. So you say, okay, so then I take a coin, and I, I you know, I, I threw this coin 100 times. And then I write in 10 lines of 10 entries the, you know, the 100 results. Okay, and I ask, uh, you know, a random machine to do it. And then I ask, well, there are a number of random machines and a number of people. And then I ask people to emulate that, right? Without using the coin, you just simply uh, write down a pattern of 100 zero ones in which your idea is that you are emulating the randomness procedure, right? So those that are used to check this can tell you with 99% probability which one was human and which one was machine. Why? Because humans, uh, we have this uh, tendency to compromise, right? That uh, in the end, you know, you deviate a little bit from the 0101 pattern. You know, you are said, you have to produce something random. Then you put a zero. And after a zero, you say, well, you should put a one, right? And after the one, you say, well, okay, let me allow another one. Okay, but it's random, so average is one half. Okay, let me now put a zero. So the point is that humans will not allow themselves to repeat the zero continuously or the one continuously beyond a given threshold. I don't know, three or four. I mean, after three, you say, well, I am, I am deviating so much from randomness. While if you do random with a coin, you can do the exercise this evening, right? You do a random, you will see that you, you find quite long series of consecutive zeros and ones. But the average is still more or less the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are asked to, I mean, the exercise is you are asked to use the same number of zeros and ones. It's just a matter of distributing them, right? And then you are said, as human, you are said, mimic randomness. And then our understanding of randomness is very much about, uh, say, equidistribution. While nature produces much wilder uh, representations of randomness. This is what uh, I meant. So, uh, Compressed sensing says, okay, fine, you can get a lot provided you choose, you know, the sampling points uh, properly. <coughs> properly. Right? Now, the question is what properly means, right? Uh, properly depends on the function you are uh, measuring, right? It's not something that is placed a priori right? And in a static. It's something that is adaptive, right? If you do it in an adaptive manner, you can get much more, right? So, but the idea is that then the sampling is done according to the observation you are being done, right? So, this is uh, in some sense related to what is the best uh, mesh size for an ODE? So how do mathematicians explain uh, ODE numerics uh, for ODEs? We say, I take the ODE, I take the, you know, the whatever, the implicit Euler or some multi-step or some Runge-Gutta method with delta t, I compute the error. If the error is too large, I divide delta t by 2 and so on, right? So for delta t, I get an error.
right? Okay, and so on. But in practice, this is not done that way. In practice, uh, this will be too expensive. You use a time adaptive numerical step, right? So that whenever the solution is, is very oscillatory, you will take delta small. But whenever the solution enters in a very large regime, you take delta large. Right? So you, you really use sampling, you exhaust your sensors whenever this is really you know, needed. You know? When the function is shaking, it's oscillating a lot. When the function enters in a, you know, in a very flat regime, right, you don't, you don't sample anymore until you feel that again something is going to happen and then you start sampling again. It's like adaptive control. It's adaptive, right? So, yeah. so the, the point is how you adapt anticipating, right? That, that's the game. And in signal processing is the same. You know, if you do uniform sampling, you can get very poor results even if you are spending a lot of sensors. So it's much better to do adaptive you know, sampling. And this is compressed sensing. Is you can get a lot out of very little, provided you choose well. The question is how to learn about how to choose. And you have to choose a priori, not a posteriori, right? Because once you have burned your sensor, you cannot use it anymore. Right? So you have use, say, n sensors, and you have to locate the n plus one. And then you have to decide where are you placing the n plus one out of the n previous informations you have, right? And without knowing what is the n plus one. Because in order to have the n plus one, you have to burn the n plus one sensor, right? Okay, so there are many, many ways of doing that, but that, that's the game to play, right? Basically, out of the previous n, you can do a, you know, an a priori estimate and then place the n plus one in an intelligent manner uh, based on the previous n plus one, say, iterations. Okay, so K concepts, feedback, I mean, that's extremely important to guarantee the stability of the control processes. If you are able to implement that in a feedback manner and you can guarantee some kind of stability, stability is, a, is an open concept, then you will be preserving this under small variations, right? So the question is, what is a small variation? A, cro a, a, a dock crossing in the highway, 120 kilometers per hour is a small variation, it's not that clear, right? But a small imperfections on the road, probably yes. Or a red light, uh, well indicated, also yes. And then applications, as we said, thermostat, uh, aircrafts, vehicles, uh, noise reduction. This is a second idea which is very important. I mean, this is the book by Hall on governors and governing mechanisms, which are precisely the one endowed with the uh, ball regulation uh, uh, feedback mechanism we, we described below or before this morning. Another idea is that control systems need to fluctuate. It's very hard to control uh, in a monotonic manner. So for instance, uh, you know, now that uh, people are uh, buying, you know, cars, uh, 20 years ago many cars didn't have air conditioning. Now all cars have climat climatizers and they even offer you different temperature for the driver and for the accompanying person, right? Uh, so if someone promises you that your car regulates temperature in a monotonic manner, uh, make sure it's not true, right? So you can regulate temperature to, say, 22 degrees, no doubt about it. Even when the car is very cold, you can increase temperature and keep it to 22, but provided you are allowed to oscillate a little bit. If you ask me to be below, that's going to be very difficult, right? 
So you need to exit, uh, oscillate a little bit. Why? Because there is always some inertia, right? After all, uh, temperature regulation uh, has to be, you know, achieved by switching, right? On and off. I mean, you are heating, you are cooling, you are heating, you are cooling, or you are heating and you are doing nothing, right? Can be uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, or can be minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, or minus 1, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 1. It's a switching strategy. But it's very hard to do it if you don't have the possibility of bypassing the bound by a level. Of course, the point is that nobody, I mean, can you make the difference between 22 and 20 22.01 uh, degrees? Probably not, right? Do you, your skin feel centigrade? Okay, probably not. So when they promise you 22, it's not 22. It's near 22. And then, okay, then you can pay. So Lagrange multipliers, we mentioned that already. Uh, I mean, this is already top of class, right? Uh, this is something we learn uh, when we are kids, right? Uh, how old you were when you learn about the Lagrange multiplier? 12 or? <laughs> no. When? High school or, or no? University? I don't remember. Is high school or university? University. 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 Yeah. yeah, okay. So. What is the point? The point is that, uh, as we mentioned before, in this, uh, you know, we were moving in this manifold that was uh, smooth, right? Like a, a mountain uh, chain, right? And I said we are minimizing distances, but now we are limited to be on the manifold, right? What the Lagrange multipliers say is this, being a critical point now, it doesn't mean that the gradient is equal to zero, because you cannot, you cannot say that you are computing variations with respect to all possible changes on x's. The x for which you are allowed to take variations is limited to leave on the manifold, right? So basically, the only variations you can do are in the direction on the tangent plane to this manifold, because you can never see the perpendicular variable. And this is actually what the criticality of Lagrange multiplier is telling you. It tells you critical for a minimization problem under constraints is that the gradient has to be parallel to the gradient of G. And the gradient of G, because the manifold under consideration is a level set, this is a level set, right, of the function G, the gradient of G is pointing in which direction? is pointing precisely on the perpendicular direction to G. And you can easily understand why is that. So assume the gradient of F was not perpendicular to G at the critical point. Assume the gradient of F was not parallel to the normal one. Then it will mean there is some projection on the tangent. There, having a projection on the tangent, it will mean that walking on, along the tangent, you could still diminish the function or augment the function depending on whether you are moving forward or backward. And this will, on the manifold, give you directions of descent and increase. So this means this cannot be a, neither a minimum nor a maximum. Okay? So you have to point in the perpendicular direction. And this is what you see there, right? So you are doing what? We are, we are maximizing this kind of uh, bubble on this hyperplane and then what uh, what they are trying to draw you here is that when you get to the extremes, there has to be uh, this perpendicularity condition, right? Okay, so you can play yourself with, uh, with this understanding. But from an analytical point of view, this is simply due to the fact that uh, uh, in order to say that, uh, remember this, Then there is the, the, say, the rigorous mathematics to make things happen. But when you say that for a minimizer, if x0 is a minimizer of a function f, then I want to conclude that the gradient of f at x0 is equal to 0, what do I do? The only thing I need to do is to write down that f0 is less than f x0 plus h. Which is true if x0 is a minimizer, right? For every h, this is true. 
then I can subtract here fx0 and I can say this is greater than 0 now I divide by h, if h is positive, this is positive and when I pass to the limit, I get the derivative of f at x0 that I get that this is positive but if h is negative, I get it to be negative so the derivative is both positive and negative, so it's 0 that's the end ok, now, if you are working in uh, n dimensions this was in one variable If you are working in n dimensions, so now f is defined on n Euclidean variables, the point x0 of minimization has n components x0, 1, x0, n. I give you a minimizer and I ask you what is the optimality condition you get? Well, now you will get the gradient is equal to zero, meaning all partial derivatives are equal to zero, meaning that I have to reproduce the same argument as before, but I do it with respect to the, all the variables on the system, the n variables, right? But assume I tell you, you see, you know, I have a problem because, you know, uh, I have a function of n variables, but I am not allowed to touch the nth. Right? So I know I have a point x0, 1, x0, n, right? And I know that when I make variations of the first n minus 1, when I make variations of the first n minus 1, I get something bigger. But I don't know what is going on with the nth, because you know the, the, the manipulator of the nth variable is not working, you know? So what do I get in that case? Do I get that the gradient of s equal to zero? No. I can reproduce the same argument as before with respect to the first n minus one variables, right? But I will not be able to do it with respect to the last one. Meaning what? Meaning that I have got that the partial derivative of f with respect to xj at the points x0, 1, x0, n is equal to 0 for all j from 1 to n minus 1. Okay? Can you guarantee that the partial derivative with respect to the nth variable is equal to 0? No chance. So you see that because the function now, the minimization was limited to a hyperplane that was missing one direction, because I was missing the perpendicular, you know, the vertical variable, the minimization was restricted to the, to the horizontal plane, I am not getting the last information. So the only thing I am saying here is what? I'm saying that the gradient is perpendicular to, or is parallel to whom? So the gradient of f, as a vector, will be a vector which has components 0, 0, 0, 0, and then something here. So meaning the, the gradient is parallel to the vector 0, 0, 0, 1, which is the perpendicular one to the, to the plane, right? So what you are doing in, in uh, Lagrange multipliers is exactly the same, right? Except that, you know, the manifold can be, you know, oblique, and then the manifold doesn't necessarily beat, you know, the horizontal plane, but it's the same idea. You work on the, on the tangent plane. And of course, to first order, you cannot distinguish the function and the tangent plane, right? To first order, the function and the first order Taylor approximation are the same. So that was the, you know, the vision of Lagrange, right? Lagrange multipliers. And why I'm telling you this? Well, because in a way or another, Whenever you minimize something subject to solving an ODE and this and that, you are always optimizing under constraints. The constraints being also the ODEs, right? So this is like, uh, there are various uh, possible definitions. Um, for instance, for partial differential equations, right? 
So what are the most famous partial differential equations you know? Transport equation. Huh? Transport equation. Transport equation. So this is uh, transport equation. So any other PV you know? Wave equation. Wave equation. So D'Alembert, right? And then what else? The heat equation, right? We mentioned that this morning. Okay, and there are many others, right? So if you were uh, talking to a person that really dislikes PDEs, you, you know what the definition of PDE will be for this person? Will be, you know, PDEs are simply uh, linear algebraic relations involving partial derivatives of functions, right? And indeed, I mean, if you, if you remove all the physics of this problem, then this becomes like a you know, very boring exercise, right? So functions, derivatives, then relations, and why this one and not the other, right? And this is why you try to always link partial differential equation theory to mechanics, right? Because otherwise it doesn't really make much sense, right? You can build as many PDEs as you wish, but what is the goal other than making your life complicated, right? So PDEs are algebraic relations involving partial derivatives, right? True. In that sense, you could say that whatever you do, whenever you are controlling or optimizing something about solutions of PDEs, you could see them as constraints that you are putting here, right? Rather than thinking on, you could say that uh, whenever you are saying something about the heat equation, you are limiting yourself to rather than considering all possible functions depending on x and t, considering only those functions, we fulfill this algebraic relation involving partial derivatives. Okay, these are linear constraints. Okay, good. And then primal and dual problems, we will come back to this, but this is already what uh, Lagrange said. Right? So in some sense, uh, uh, you know, you can directly work in the physical space or you can really work here on the Lagrange multipliers and you can probably see better. And these primal dual problems, we will come back to this, is related to this idea of, uh, of uh, Wiener that uh, cybernetics is the science and control and communications in animals and machines. So maybe just before we go for the break, um, do you know about conjugate, uh, conges, uh, convex conjugate functions? Do you know about convex conjugate functions? No? No, no, you see. Uh, did you ever? No, I mean, uh, simply real. Do you know this uh, inequality? What is the name of this? Huh? Well, yes, or yeah, in this case, yes, it's young, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, young inequality, you know young inequality. Uh, you know young inequality for, you know this young inequality, we can compute the CP, but what is really important is that, uh, do you know what is the connection between P and Q for this young inequality to be true? If I give you P equal 3 over 4, or uh, sorry, 3 over 2, what will be the Q? You don't remember this uh, Young inequality? Young. Uh, P and Q are related by this formula, right? Okay? Don't waste time uh, taking notes. Think. Brain. No hand. Brain. That's the problem. You take notes, but you don't think. P is between 1 and infinity, you take 1 over P plus 1 over Q equal to 1, then this inequality 
is true. So this means that whenever you have a product, you can always estimate by taking just a little bit more than linear here, A, like for instance a square, and then you have a square here. But if rather than taking a square, you will take here, say, 3 over 2, more than 1, but less than 2, then you have to take more here. Why? Because what is the, con uh, what is the convex conjugate of 3 over 2? You have to put the reverse of this, 2 over 3, plus 1 over 3 is equal to 1. So Q is equal to 3. So this is somehow the most equilibrated Young inequality. Power 2 in both. If you push 1 to 1, right, this 1 to 1, the other one has to go to infinity. Right? So you will take here, you know, something like uh, P, which is uh, P, which is, uh, say, N plus 1 over N, which is a number that when N goes to infinity is going down, down, down to N, then the Q will be N. Then the other one has to grow, 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 grow. Okay, so exercise, prove the Young inequality for any two pairs and compute what is the CP and the CQ. I mean, you, you, you can do it with that very easily, but uh, of course you can find it written everywhere. I mean, this is a first year calculus exercise. But then, then someone discovered that this has nothing to do with the power functions. This is a much more general thing, right? And then this was done for general convex functions. Of course, power functions with powers greater than 1 are convex functions. So then people said, uh, I give you a convex function. Then you can introduce the convex conjugate. And actually, the way you compute, right, or define the convex conjugate is just for this inequality to be true, meaning that phi star of b is the maximum with respect to a of uh, a b minus phi a. <coughs> okay, so how does the theory go? You take a function phi, convex, right? Okay, maybe something like a parabola, but the point is that the growth is not necessarily quadratic. It can be, you know, power 3 over 2, or can be something like uh, linear plus logarithm, like x log x, or it can be x log 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 x, it's slightly bigger than linear, right? That's enough. So then, given such a function, you can define the maximum on a with respect to of this function, right? This will give you the value of phi star b. And this function is convex and is the so-called convex conjugate, right? So exercise, check that the uh, conjugate defined that way of a convex function is convex. And then once you have this, by definition, you have this inequality. Why you have this inequality? Well, it's because simply phi star b is the max with respect to a. So whenever you take any a, phi star of b is greater than this difference, and therefore you have this inequality for all a. Okay, and then the last exercise is, please tell me what is the growth when b goes to infinity if phi a grows like exponential a when a goes to infinity. So according to you, so assume you were in a desperate situation and your life will depend on the fact that uh, you will say a word 
that will be related to the answer. Just one word. Just one word. Okay, I, I let you play this game. Okay, so each of you, please, uh, we close this session by, please, don't, don't watch each other. In a piece of paper, write a word that, uh, I mean, you have to save your life. You are in an extreme situation. And the game is the following. After this introduction to convex conjugate, people ask you, could you please tell me what is the expected growth of the convex conjugate, knowing that phi depends, uh, grows exponentially? You know already that if uh, this is a square, this is a square. And that when you take a power here that is diminishing, the power here has to increase. So there is kind of a, a balance law, right? Okay, now, in some sense, I, I tell you, the phi increases exponentially. Beyond any polynomial exponentially. Then I ask you, and your life depends on your coffee, say. Let's say your coffee depends on this. Okay? I don't think we are, uh, you know, in uh, European projects, I don't think we can uh, bet uh, lives, right? So, uh, exponential, and then uh, what is the growth? So, just put in a piece of paper without watching the others, and we will see how many of you please answer the question. Uh, and, uh, and you give me the, the answer. Do you have the answer? No, okay. <laughs> I mean, this is anonymous. Don't uh, you don't risk anything. This is the difference between passivity and uh, you know active control and passive control. Good. Has acertado or no? <laughs> okay. Did you finish? Okay, but what is the problem? Please do it. Just do it quickly. One word? How many words did you write? One word, but then I can't. So that was like okay. Did you? Okay, finish. So we're waiting for you. If you don't do it, we can. So can you write a word, please? Just a word. I mean, you can. Yeah, I don't know. You. You can put vacations. No, no. Mete and 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 more. Okay. Okay, did you finish? Okay, let's do it. So what do we do? If we, if we don't succeed 50%, we escape coffee or...? No? Okay. Oh, this is not very anonymous, right? <laughs> exponentially. Well, exponentially is not the answer because exponentially is phi. We are looking for the convex conjugate. Someone here says exponentially, no. Exponentially is phi. The other one is the one we are looking for. Oh, someone says, uh, this is more smart, someone says exponential minus a. That's what I, I meant, I mean. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is, yeah, good, uh, that's a good point. So it could be this, right? One grows exponentially, <laughs> the other one decays exponential minus a, but this is not totally correct because both of them grow, you know? Both of them go to infinity. One goes like power plus one, and the other one power like nearly infinity. It's not that one goes to infinity and the other one goes to zero. Both have to go to infinity. So exponential minus a, zero. I mean, zero is a very good solution because there is this saying that if you are really desperate, you either choose zero or one. <laughs> so this is a sign of a desperate answer. Zero, too desperate. Uh, unbounded. Yeah, that's correct, but it's probably not accurate enough, right? It's like uh, saying you ask for coffee and then you get liquid, right? <laughs> you know, you got liquid. <laughs> liquid break. Decrease exponentially. No, it has to increase. Yeah, I see you are tempted to exponential decrease <laughs> someone broke the rule logarithm logarithm 
the logarithm goes to infinity and is very likely to be part of the answer. I don't know whether it's log, it's maybe x, log x, or is log, log x, or, but it's related, definitely is related to the logarithm. I bet it's related to the logarithm. Exponential minus a. Exponential minus a. One. Okay, another desperate. <laughs> okay, we got one, so we can go for coffee. Good. Huh? Oh, which one? Oh, log. This uh, I, I think.